The way that I'm planning on running this for this morning is basically just running through GemCut Studio, basic optimization features, and then certain scenarios that you're probably going to run into comparatively often for how to optimize stuff. So things like raising the RI, making, it, making sure it still looks good. Lowering the RI, making sure it still looks good, which is much more of a pain in the ass. Optimizing for dispersion, and then how do you pick from a whole bunch of different angle proportions if everything looks kind of vaguely good. Once we're done with that, that's like question mark half an hour, question mark 45 minutes, depends on how fast I'm talking. Um, then open Q&A for whatever questions you guys have. Um, Jeff Pitt Studio related, preferably, or optimization related, preferably, but like any question, don't care, I'm totally happy. So with that, let's get the design loaded up and I'll be pulling up my notes every now and again because my short-term memory sucks. That's Great. all right. So here's, we've got GemCut Studio open. We've got our main screen. We've got instructions over on the top left, the design window on the top right, so there's your design view, and then your render view on the bottom right. The so how did, you, how did you actually do that? It doesn't come up like that. You, really? Yeah. This is, the mind doesn't fit anyway. Oh, this is like the standard base. Okay. Like, this is how it should show up like when you open if you wanted, If you wanted the design of the optimization to the right, for instance, how would you change that in order to put the optimization there? I honestly have no idea how to rearrange these windows. I've never even like bothered to try that. Okay. But you can go to view and you can go to render. Right, no, I know. That will only show render. Yeah, so that's actually what we're going to be in. So we're just going to be in this render window, for the most part. Okay, let's, all right. So right now what I've got is a standard RAM Brilliant loaded up in quartz. Doesn't look so great. We've got it set in the lighting model of random. So some people will see this in their uh, Jump Cut Studio as GCS random. Some people will just see it as random. Depends on the version you have. First thing we're going to do is we're going to turn on window colors. So there's a separate option way down here at the bottom that says use separate window color. There's a little bit of a visual trick to looking at windowing, and that has to do with how the brain does contrast. Brains are very strange and stupid, and they don't do things the way you expect them to. So the best way to look at contrast for windowing, set your stone to a light green and your window color to a rich pink, or set your stone to a very light blue and set your window color to orange. I typically prefer pink, just because it's easier for my eyes. Um, and honestly, at this point, I don't even change the color of the stone to green. But looking at like brain mapping and eye stuff, that's theoretically what you should do. Pull on the notes real quick. Great. Some other things that you're going to want to change in your settings before you start messing around. Down here, we've got an option that says number of bounces. That is super <coughs> important to set as high as you can. What that means is basically when light enters the stone, how many times is it going to bounce inside the stone and how is GenCag going to look at that? So if you say, so like this design doesn't look great right now anyway, but let's say you set it to a super low setting. Oh, I guess he fixed that. All right, never mind. Let me pull up a better example. All right. So let's say we take that bounce number and we lower it down. Notice how some of that detail in the gem design looks like it's disappeared. And then as we crank it up, more bits appear. Not hugely important, but for some designs, it can make the difference between something looking as you'd expect and something looking terrible. Great. So we've got that set up done. Now we're going to talk very briefly about the lighting model of GemCat and GemCat Studio. So when you have this little render window and you see what the stone looks like on a screen, GemCat Studio thinks that you've taken your gem, you've cut your gem, and you've just dropped it in a block of concrete or like you've stuck it in some modeling clay. Absolutely no light is getting in through the girdle. Absolutely no light's coming in through the bottom. Um, like the most aggressive bezel set that you could possibly do with like gold sitting directly on the stone or whatever. So most gems aren't set like, like you've got prongs, you've got some light coming in through the sides, you've got some light coming in through the girdle. So take all of these renders with a grain of salt. They're not 100% accurate. There's some other details about the actual lighting models that I'll run through a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at 
the lighting models. So if you guys have done some stuff in GemCAD, you'll know that there are GemCAD Studio, sorry. I'm so used to GemCAD. You'll know that they have random, isometric, cosine, and angle rings. Uh, depending on the version you have, you might have all of these options, or you might just have like some shorter ones. But the big ones are random, isometric, and cosine. So what does that actually mean, and why does the stone look different when you do different renderings and different stuff? So here's what those actual like light maps look like. When you pull up random in GemCut Studio, that basically means there's like 8,000 lights everywhere in the room. Like some of the lights are big, some of the lights are small, some of them are like LEDs. Um, and it's as if you've got all of those lights, but you're in a pitch black room otherwise. ISO or isometric means imagine yourself in like a, a dome shaped room and there's just like a crap ton of light everywhere, 100% of the light is even everywhere. For cosine, imagine that you're in that same dome shaped room, there's a giant bright light at the top of the room and nothing else and that light kind of fades as it goes down to the sides. So that's kind of what those mean and we'll talk about why they're useful as different things as we're kind of running through this. Great. People often ask about these graphs. I will tell you that generally these graphs are garbage and not super helpful. But <laughs> I learned that recently. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's some use in them. Um, it'll help you figure out, like right off the bat, is a design garbage? Does it need very heavy optimization? So standard round brilliant, obviously not designed for ports. And we'll take a look at the little lines here. So typically, I just look at ISO brightness. So if you're in that messy whole room that like has infinite light, how much light is the stone putting out? And this looks pretty bad. Normally, you'd want it somewhere between 60 and 90 percent. This little white line looks pretty terrible. The center here, the zero, is if you're looking at the stone straight on. As you go farther to the left, as you go further to the right, that's if the stone tilts left and right and up and down. So not great. We'll look at cosine brightness. So if you remember, cosine is the one with the giant light at the ceiling and nothing else on the sides. That helps show you contrast. In general, you want that to be high. It doesn't have to be as high as ISO brightness. But looking at this, it's pretty terrible. Or pretty terrible. If we look at table values, the dotted lines, that's just the same information directly under the table. But that's kind of taking stuff in context. If your table is super small and everything looks good under the table, but it looks like crap everywhere else, your stone still looks like crap. So for the most part, that's not a helpful number. All right, before we start moving on to the actual optimization stuff, questions, comments from here. All right, any questions about understanding or like basic use of that little light graph? Yeah, I thought the windowing, the indication you show for the window, I thought you actually, that does give you an indication of how much windowing you're going to have through the table down to the base, down to the cooler. So the window feature, there's two different ones. There's a window, which is the orangish line, and right. there's the window under the table, which is the dotted line. Right. So that does tell you I thought you wanted of, to minimize that. Kind of. The problem with GemCut Studio and the problem with doing 3D rendering of gems in general is that it assumes that you have one eyeball and you're looking directly at the stone from something like six feet away. When you look at a stone in real life, you're always looking like your eyes are not exactly in the center of your head. They're a little bit far, like far apart from each other. And typically, you're holding the stone a little bit closer. So when you're looking at a stone in real life, you're actually looking at it from two different cameras at something like 10 degrees of tilt. So the window feature in GemCut Studio will tell you if you're looking straight on. And that can kind of be useful in terms of what's like the overall perception of windowing. But, and let's take a quick look here. We'll tilt the stone a little bit this way. So if you're looking at this stone, the left side of the stone is kind of, like it's still got some light output, it's still got some stuff going on. The right side of the stone is windowed. If you're looking at that from two different angles, one eye is going to see the stone as extremely bright, not windowed at all, and the other eye is going to see it as very windowed. 
So there's a lot of cases, particularly with apex designs, where you can have what looks like a terrible windowing on the little tilt graph, but in real life, if you're holding the stone in your hand, you're not going to see it at all. Gen Pet Studio 2 question mark is supposed to have 3D rendering, like meaning you can look at it, cross your eyes, and it looks 3D to you. Um, but I don't know when that's going to come out, and Reg hasn't given me any kind of time. So once that happens, windowing will be a completely different thing, and it's going to be much easier to optimize for. But as of right now, this is what we have. All right. Uh, any other questions? Questions about the lighting models? We'll talk about angle rings and stuff later. So um, okay. yeah, all right. I, um, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, when you presented. You guys had a, um, a graphs up on the screen, and I don't think I remember how to get there, but not graphs, I'm sorry, uh, front-facing images, but there are multiple colors. Oh, that's uh, what we're going to go to next. Okay, cool. So we've got our standard RAM Brilliant in quartz. We've got it loaded up. So here we're going to go to Tools, and we're going to go to Manual Optimizer. Were you talking about this one? It was. I just um, didn't know how we had all the colors in it representing different lighting models last oh, time. That, and oh. we'll talk about that later. There we go. That is, that is very important stuff that we will not talk about right this second. Cool. All okay. right, so when you're looking at the manual optimizer, this basically shows you your stone with a whole bunch of different crown and pavilion height proportions. The standard is typically 120 to 80%, so you're not like stretching it way too far. You're not making your pavilion so deep that a jeweler's gonna kill you for it. But there's like five little pictures here, and that's not as helpful as it could be. So let's do nine. So here we can see increments of like 4% stretch, or like 5%, I don't even remember what it is. But that lets us get a good sense of kind of where the design's gonna be terrible, like what proportions just make no sense. So like out here in the top right corner, 100% windowing. This little column, you know, these two columns, it's either 100% windowed or just straight up extinct. So over here, these ones, tons of windowing, tons of windowing, tons of windowing. So when we're looking at this design, it looks like there are no good options for the layout of these facets that's going to give us a pretty good looking stone. Uh, the periphery of the stone here, just because of the actual lighting model in Gen Pet Studio, <laughs> like it's not going to look this bad. It's going to look decent in real life, but it's not going to look great. So how do we pick something? Well, let's test out a couple of things. Great. Uh, all right, so first things first, let's see just what do we have to cut this exact design in to make it look good? Like how high does the refractive index need to be without any changes to the design before I'm willing to say, okay, this is like something I would personally cut. So let's just jump up to like barrel. And some of these designs, like some of these proportions over here, look like they should be pretty good. But this is just face on. So if we tilt it, well, it still windows right away. And we kind of expect that. So let's see what it looks like in light paradigm. A little bit better, a little bit better. So there's tons of different layouts where things are bright. They look evenly bright. They look interesting. We tilt it. Uh, still a little window. Let's try this one out. And this one looks a little bit better, so not nearly as much of a tilt window. Still interesting, still some good light output. It's got some cool little contrasty stuff in here. So as written, for me personally, if I wanted to say, like, this design looks good in this material, we tried it out in quartz, definitely no. It took us all the way up until we got to 1.65 Peridot before we could say, hey, reasonable. So let's look at the other set of doing things, which is modifying a design, like changing the arrangement of the facets so that it looks good. So here we've gone back to our basic standard round brilliant. We're still in quartz. So what are we going to do next? Well, let's try bringing it to the best looking thing that we can so far, and then make changes from there. So somewhere along this line, there's stuff that's like barely tilt window. When you look in the little pink areas, if you can still see the arrangement of facets and kind of see some interesting light going on, that means that it's re either really close to the critical angle or it's like a reasonable starting point. So I'm going to go ahead and just start with you. So now, how, 
What? Yeah. Go for it. If you wanted to, at that point, if you go back to that screen now, and you've selected, you've applied that particular cut pattern. Yeah. So go back to the manual optimizer again. Sure. Yeah. So now that's your center. That's your once you've applied it. Doesn't doesn't that become your center? Yes. So once I've applied this, once I've clicked apply, this now becomes the center. The center right here. Now, if you change your crown range and your pavilion range to go from the 80 to 120, if you limit that down to 95 to 105 and on both, now you still have those same number of stones shown, but you have a much uh, narrower range. Of narrower range, so you can actually hone in on exactly which one you like as an optimized piece. Yeah, so you can do that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. The other thing, thank you for reminding me, is that you can also kind of jump through things a bunch of times in the manual optimizer. So we picked something in the manual optimizer, and then we opened it back up, and that changes our whole view. So now, if you look at these guys down here, well, they're still not great, but they're better than some of the other options that popped up. So let's go ahead and apply that. And then let's go back to the manual optimizer. Hey, look, we've still got some stuff that may be potentially better. The problem with this is that if you keep jumping into the manual optimizer and you keep kind of running down the line, eventually, just because of the way optics works, you will end up with weird things. You might end up in trillions, for example, with a pavilion that's incredibly steep or like a ledge reflector. Or in round designs, you might end up with a crown that's paper thin. And let's actually check that out. So here, we went from a pretty tall crown to a pretty thin crown. And if we keep jumping through the manual optimizer, we'll end up getting a crown that's so flat that you might as well just cut a flat table. All right, so let's hop back to this option. So we've got this over here. Let's try to tweak individual tiers and see if we can get something to look a little bit better. So right now what I've done is I've selected this pavilion tier. We're going to go ahead and edit it. I want to set that tier to kind of lock in place. So I've selected this meet point. Now, Gem Cut Studio knows that I want this tier to meet this point at all times. And no matter how much I change the angle, it'll still stay locked in there. So let's go ahead and hit that Find Adjustment button. And that'll let us slowly change things. Now, how did you lock it there, Aria, to where it, sure. it stays at that meet? All right, so we'll select the tier. We'll hit Edit Tier. And then to lock it in place on any particular meet point, you click Add Meet, oh. and then select that meet point. Um, in a more complicated design, if you've got a bunch of different meet points that you can choose from, that lets you pick which meet points. Uh, you can like change the uh, rotational index, but that is a little bit beyond the scope of today. So let's go ahead, we'll change some stuff. We'll try changing the angle, okay. So it looks like if we're just changing the angle of our pavilion mains, we're still gonna get some degree of windowing or we're gonna get some degree of extinction. There's a whole bunch of other adjustments we can make. We can try tweaking the crown. We can try tweaking the proportions of the crown in terms of how big are the like stars or how big are the breaks compared to the mains or whatever. But that's kind of the basics of how you would go about doing that. And to be honest, I'm not a fan of cutting standard red brilliance and low RI materials anyway. So that's kind of the basic run through of the methods. Let's yep, did that, did that. Great. So let's talk about taking a low refractive index design. So this is written for quartz and we'll try bumping it up to a high refractive index. In general, that shouldn't cause you any problems. Like, the old rule was you could just take your low refractive index design and cut it any high refractive index material. There are some cases where that doesn't work. Triangles, pentagons, um, some ovals, uh, some designs that are like, really long, that rule kind of goes out the window, and it's important to just check, in per like, check manually. So that's what we're going to do here. So let's say I want to cut this design and like spin out or something. I don't know. So we'll go to spin out. 
So it still looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and take a look at the manual optimizer and see if there's anything else that might look a little bit better. And it looks like this, with no changes, looks pretty good. There's a whole bunch of different options with a little bit of change that also look good. So at that point, you can kind of craft your selection based off of what's going to give you the best yield. Like let's say you've got a super thin or flat piece of rough, well, then you're going to want to go with the option that has the shallow ground. Uh, let's say you've got something that's a little bit on the chunkier side or like you've got a lot of crown height, great, you can get one of these options. So this design, great, we don't have to worry about it. But what about the opposite case? If we have a high refractive index design, we want to cut it in a low refractive index material. That can be a little bit trickier. So this design is technically written for, I think, GGG. I honestly can't remember. Maybe like one of those other bright things. There's a little bit of like windowing, but that's kind of that crushed ice effect that people like in diamonds. So let's take that and let's lower it to like uh, Tanzanite. And as soon as we do that, we see that some extinction appears. So this does not look as good. Let's go to the manual optimizer. We'll kind of take a look in here. Excuse me, can you explain the extinction again? Oh yeah, sure. So, in these higher refractive index materials, we've got some light coming back at you here, light coming back at you here, not so much in these little corner areas. But when we lower the refractive index, these black areas appear. And that could be a bunch of different things. If you're using head shadow, which you can do in Gemray or GemCut Studio, but you don't have to, then sometimes what like the black areas represent you, like literally your head blocking out the light that's going to stone. In some designs, it just means that these are areas where no matter what position of lights you have in the room, there is no direction that that light can travel to show up in those areas. So those areas will look black in any lighting condition. And that's what extinction is. There's other things that people call extinction, like uh, some people will say that the, the black part of closed C tourmaline is extinction. It's not, that's just not accurate. Some people will say that like really, really dark garnets where light doesn't pass through have extinction. That's not accurate use of the term. So we're just using it here as this is an area where no light's coming back to you. So let's fix that. So we went into the manual optimizer, and we're just taking a look at that big old map. And again, thankfully, it looks like there's a whole bunch of different options that could potentially work. So like this guy over here looks pretty good. We tilt it around, not bad. Like tilt windowing, fairly minimal. Let's look at this guy over here. Very different effect. I have to tilt the stone a decent amount to get it to window, and it's just windowing in this limited area under the table. Not bad. So a bunch of different options, and that took all of like five seconds. Great. So what if we have a bunch of good options? Like how do you decide which of the many different options you want to pick? So let's take a look at this design. It's an easy little triangle. Go into manual optimizer. And hey, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this kind of middle row that looks pretty decent, right? So, how do we decide which one we want? You could go to the graph and take a look at everything and just kind of compare how the graph looks. But remember that graph, but like when you have a bunch of different designs that all look pretty good, the graph isn't going to help you make that decision. That's more of like aesthetic taste or what looks good to you. So let's start out by turning off windowing. Because we remember that these like middle three rows, this kind of strip right here, did pretty well. So here's where those other lighting models come into play. Remember that isometric one where you're in that dome shaped room where there's just infinite light everywhere? Well, that doesn't really give us huge amounts of information here because they're all just really bright. So let's try moving to the next one, the cosine. And suddenly things look very different. So if you remember, this one has a light in the ceiling of your dome shaped room and nothing else, so just kind of light fades <coughs> as you move back to the sides. 
And what that does is it shows you the contrast pattern of the gender. <coughs> so where are the light areas? Where are the dark areas? There's two different approaches that people can take here. You can either go for a stone that has the maximum brightness. Like from all directions, from whatever, it's just going to look super bright. But visually, that's not really as interesting as a design that has some contrast. For something like this, where you've got some light areas and some alternating dark areas, as you tilt the stone, you're going to see a lot of scintillation. If this stone has dispersion, you're going to see better dispersion. There's also a weird effect that kind of the brain does for you, where if you look at those bright areas and you look at the dark areas, your brain gets confused a little bit and thinks, hey, those bright areas are probably way brighter than they actually are. So your eye thinks that the stone is brighter. There's a, a really good optical illusion that I forgot to pull up where it's got some like shadowed areas and some like super bright areas in the picture. And you're like, hey, this shadow is really dark. And then they cut out all the other picture, all the other part of the picture, and you look at the shadow and you look at like the super bright areas, and it turns out they're exactly the same. Your brain is just saying, like it's doing whatever the hell it wants to. So that being said, let's take a quick look at some of these designs. So we've got some interesting contrast going on here. We've got some interesting contrast going on over here. So how do we pick between these? That's where we start getting some weird, interesting stuff. So there are three general lighting patterns that people will use to determine that kind of information. If you are familiar with the asset map, so this is what a lot of diamond groups will use to say, our diamond is cut to ideal proportions. Our diamond is blah, 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 whatever. So if we look at asset mapping, you'll see stuff like this. And if you look at the actual map, so remember, this is a dome-shaped room. In the middle, like in the, the top of the light, you've got a blue light for some reason. As we move back to the sides, you've got some red. And then way over on like the floor, light coming in from the sides of the stone will be green. So for something like this, you want the middle lights to show up as best as possible, and you want the outer light to show up as little as possible. So if we're using the asset map, we want to try to minimize green, maximize red, and some blue in there is totally fine. Or so you think. So let's take a look at something that has a lot of red and very little green or blue. So how does that actually look in your life? Well, it looks terrible. You've got a whole bunch of windowing out on the, on the sides. You've got a giant window in the middle. But, I mean, our asset map looked good, right? Had a whole bunch of red everywhere. Well, so that's why you have to take these things with a grain of salt. So if you look at something like this, or let's say you look at something like this. Whole bunch of green, whole bunch of green, some red. What is this going to look like in real life? Well, all of that green light that's coming in from the sides it's going to be pretty like dark. It's going to be pretty dull and uninteresting. We've got a very limited amount of red. So what's that going to look like in real life? A little bit duller, a little bit less interesting. Not terrible, but not great. So let's go back to that. What about something like this? Still has a decent amount of red, right? We've got some interesting blue in here. Minimize the green. So this should look pretty good. And when we check it out, yeah, it doesn't look bad at all. There's two other lighting maps that can be used. There's AG, which just has a different distribution of colors. So you look at that, you've got red still in the middle, you've got some green, you've got purple. You want to try and minimize the cyan blue color. Or you've got the GemCut Studio light model has more colors and a better range of colors. It's easier to see. You want to get rid of gray and pink and keep all the rest. So here, we've got tiny little slivers of pink, no gray, and we've got some blue, we've got some yellow, we've got some red. Here, we've got same thing, pretty limited pink, no gray, so this should be pretty good. Same down here, very limited gray, very limited pink, so all this should be pretty good. So questions on the lighting maps. So questions on things like these angle rings. Anybody have any questions? So is the purpose of this just to know what you're seeing in the stone, where the light's coming from? Right? So th those 
you had up uh, the pictures with the different rings of colors. I assume the color in the center you said is coming from the top of the room, right? right? So that's just kind of map what you're seeing and where the light is hitting in the snow. Right. So okay. to put it in context, if you're if you've got your like your stone and you're walking around like one of the shows and you're just like you're just holding your stone and looking at it, is there really going to be any like light source on the ground? Like who has spotlights in their house that are on the ground pointing up at your face? Like that's just not a thing. So when you're using the asset map and you see a bunch of green, like. In real life, what that would be is like I've got a light. Let's say I've got a lamp sitting on this table over here, and it's pointed directly at me. Or I've got a light on the floor, and it's pointed upwards at my face. Like you don't look at gems in those kinds of conditions. So it's basically is what you're saying. It's like where's the light coming from? How do I know? Yeah. So let's say I had like a sunstone, and twenty percent of the pavilion has some color to it, and I want to optimize for the color in that 20%. Which one of the lighting schemes would I use in order to try to maximize the color reflected from the pavilion? So that is a very complicated question. Um, that JumpCut Studio doesn't have the ability to model for that yet. Um, that's going to be in version 2.0. And the, the question that you're asking is basically about color zoning and right. how are you going to place your color zone in that, like, in whatever design you use. The, the very short answer is that generally you want a design that's going to be a little bit darker. You want a design that's going to have a steeper pavilion and you're going to want to put the color zone in the exact geographic center of the stone. There's a whole bunch of complicated reasons for that. Uh, every so often, people will try to say, oh, you should put the color at the very bottom of the pavilion, and it'll like flood the stone with color. In practice, that doesn't actually work. Uh, it works for very small stones. And as your stone gets larger, that gets worse and worse, to the point where you'll have, like for your sunstone example, if you put your red color in the bottom of the pavilion, and you've got like a 15 millimeter stone, the area directly under the table will be red and all of the rest of the stone will be white. Um, that, like the details of that, I should have a printout somewhere that I can send you, but that's like definitely beyond the scope of this time. Yep. Okay, so any other questions about the angle ring and how we're using that to look at whether designs are good or not? No. All right, moving on. Let's take a look at dispersion because people are always like, oh, I've got some Cuban zirconia and I want to hoop rainbows. How do I do that? <laughs> so let's make things hoop some rainbows. So here we've got just a design. Let's go ahead and change the material to rutile, which has the highest index of dispersion of basically anything that you're going to get your hands on. All right, so here's this design. The computer's having a hard time loading it because it's just very, very aggressively rainbow. But how are we going to optimize for this? The first thing, always make sure that your window color is off because that's going to make everything thick. And it just makes it hard to see this version. So we'll go into the manual optimizer again. And you're going to see a whole bunch of different like options that may look good, like they've got some flashes of color. They've got some interesting sparkly bits. They've got what looks like some orange areas, some like pink, red, green, blue, whatever. This guy over here, plenty of stuff like that. But what you're probably also noticing is that some of these designs have a lot of black and white, and it's not where you'd expect. Like typically you see a bunch of extinction like way out on the sides, or way out on the sides. But here, you've got a super bright stone and a dead area in the middle. Here, you've got something that's got a bunch of interesting activity under the table. And then for some reason, all of this is just red. And that's just an artifact of GemPet Studio. That's not actually how it's going to look in real life. So how do we pick which one we want? Hard question. Generally, you basically just have to look through all of these by hand. Find a design that doesn't have a lot of black areas in it. 
you want to make sure that there's some like whitish gray stuff. That means there's light coming back at you. You want to see big areas of color. So that's those flashes of the dispersion, flashes of fire coming back at you. Pick a couple of different ones. Like this one looks decent. This one over here looks decent. Not so much. We've got some dark areas out on the side. This looks kind of dark. This looks kind of dark. This looks kind of dark. So probably not the best one. This one looks pretty lively. So now we want to go back and turn off dispersion and turn on windowing. So we take the slider, set it all the way off, turn that back on, and go back to our optimizer map. And suddenly what we're seeing is that these design, like these different variations, have a ton of windowing, but they're like small little scatter variables. Some of them had a giant amount of windowing, like that one where we saw that giant black area in the middle. So we definitely want to reject that. So let's take a look at some of the options we found. So we said that this one looked pretty decent. It looks <coughs> kind of OK, but there's all that light loss there. This one over here looked pretty good. And when we select it, it still looks pretty good. There's like these tiny little triangles that window. But in reality, you're probably not going to see that in the hand as you're moving a stone around. And we've got these tiny little areas out here which are giving the stone a crush nice effect. We can also take a look at something like this. Those little triangle windows are a little bit bigger, but there's otherwise pretty good stuff. And then remember, we want to look at our contrast. So we'll turn on cosine. And here, we'll take a look at our options again. This one, pretty dark. This one over here, well, that looks pretty good. And I can't even remember where the other one was, so we'll just stick with this one. And to be totally honest, when I'm optimizing for dispersion, a lot of the times I just forget which one was a good option. All right, so we've got this. We've turned our dispersion back on. Looks pretty good. You always want to do your tilt test, because just because it looks good face up doesn't mean it's going to have those little rainbow sparkles. And it turns out that this has so much rainbow sparkle that my computer can't actually load it in time. So in, in this selection, you've never gone back to the graph to look at your peak brightness of the stone. You're only looking at the dispersion and the extinction, right? Right. So for this, when I'm optimizing for dispersion, I generally don't look at the graph. The other thing is that when you're optimizing for dispersion, the more dispersion a stone has, it actually costs you brightness because the light that you normally be seeing like as bright is being broken down and split up into different colors. For any stone, like the higher the dispersion is, the more of that color leads to loss of how much light ends up in your eye. Um, there's an old write-up in like from GIA from like 2005 that looks at exactly why that works the way it does, but again, outside of the scope of today. Alright, so we talked about that. Pause and rendering. Alright. And if you remember, I had some like we talked about oh. Sorry, give me just a second. Hopefully I'm just trying to get a little bit. Cool. So sometimes Gem Cut Studio lies to you. <laughs> and this is a good example. So this is a design written for barrel. And if you looked at Gem Cut Studio, this looks like it should be like 90% window. If you look at that tilt performance graph, it looks not bad, but not great. It looks like it's in the 50% range, so pretty damn dark. But what does this actually look like in real life? Uh, it looks like that. It's not window. It's pretty rich in color. And if I remember correctly, this was a super, super, super pale, I think blue light, some kind of tourmaline. Super, super, super pale. And it ended up very saturated. So why is that? Well, remember, Gem Cut Studio's lighting model doesn't do a great job. So sometimes we just have to take a look at the design and just see what's going on. 
So this guy, super deep, super tall, which for the most part makes colors a little bit richer. When we tilt it, suddenly we see a whole bunch of extra brightness. Remember how I was talking about the eyeballs? They're like a little bit off in the center. So each eyeball looks at the stone from 10 degrees of tilt. Well, just to prove a point, let's set the stone to 10 degrees of tilt. So one eye is going to see this, and the other eye is going to see that. And when your brain tries to merge what the two eyes are seeing, you're going to get something that is a mix of both of the brightest areas. <coughs> When you look at that picture in the camera, again, the camera is like, there's all kinds of weird issues with taking gem photography. But there's also light coming in from the side, which Gem Cut Studio doesn't follow. And this stone is so deep that there is going to be a ton of light coming in from the side, bouncing off of these weird little edges and going into your eye that are going to add color. So just because something looks like crap in this little view doesn't mean that it actually will. <coughs> Great. So okay. when Gem Cut Studio does the ray trace for the reflective light traces, it assumes that the table is actually all the way buried in mud? It assumes or in a, in a, in a bezel? Yeah, so it assumes, well not all the way to the table, but it assumes that all the way to the girdle, the like the stone is completely... Uh, yeah, that's what I yeah, meant. Yeah, so it assumes that the stone is completely bezel, uh, and that absolutely no light is coming in through the sides. Okay. Alright, so I think this was our run through, uh, looks like it was about 45 minutes. Open question and answer, um, any questions about optimizing, Gem Cut Studio, anything else? Have yeah, so I've got two stones here that uh, came from patterns out of the Vietnamese cutters. They're not fan trones Viet gems, but these are Eddie Nine Sunshine uh, from one of his friends. The bright one yep. is cut at the recommended angles, which go down to about 30 degrees on the pavilion way below critical angle, these are ports. The other one I experimented and I just raised the angles so that they were around uh, 40, 42, which is a common recommended angle for ports. Yeah. The one at 42 is obviously way darker. Mm -hmm. The one that goes down is at 10 degrees below critical angle is beautiful. Yes. So I, why? That is a great question. So let's go back to our standard round brilliant. So what you're seeing is the Portuguese effect. So for stones that have kind of that steep sloping sides and then end up coming to a fairly shallow or even like subcritical angle, like end of the pavilion, depending on how you've set things up, depending on how small your table is, you may never actually see the window that should show up. If you look at this design over here, we've got a whole bunch of what looks like windowing around the side and a very small bright area in the middle. For the for the stone that you had over there, that was cut to the, like the correct angles. This is the effect that you're seeing. The correct angles directly under the center of the stone are returning light, but everything else around it is leaking. So that's why even though it looks like there's a brighter spot and you've done it to like the, the numbers are correct, that bright area is pretty limited and everything else is leaking. If we change this to, I mean, here's like a, it's not a perfect analogy, but here, all of the surroundings, like all of the outside of stone, is pretty <coughs> The center is window. But if we make that table smaller, all of that bright area on the app, actually, let's try that. Yeah, so here is the effect that you're seeing when the angles are way too shallow. Like, they're definitely below the critical angle. But it doesn't really matter if the area that's windowing is super small. And so is that because as the light goes in on your stone mm -hmm. uh, into the facets just below the table, 
they bend as they enter the stone and that and so you don't have the straight down across and up effect if it goes through the table so let's take a quick look so here we fired one light ray straight through the table it bounces off of our facets that are too far past the critical angle and it leaks out but what happens if we fire one out here. Well, when it enters that crown facet, because the crown facet isn't perfectly straight, the light bends a little bit when it enters. So by the time that light gets to our facet down here that's below the critical angle, well, the light's already bent a little bit. So now it thinks that that facet is appropriate, like it's above the critical angle. So it ends up bouncing correctly, and then comes back out. So a, a lot of those BF gems patterns, and, and I've, I've got about 80 of them, go well below critical angle. Yep. But a lot of them come to a very small, very tiny tape. Exactly. And that's how they get away with it. That's how they get away with it. Um, it also depends on the, the crown angles. Like The crown angles have to match. Like The amount that the pavilion angles are too shallow you have to relate that to how much the crown angles are just like disproportionate. And he works in Jump Cut Studio, so he's probably doing the yeah. same analysis. He's doing the exact same stuff. So your recommendation is actually for to not look at the brightness of the stone, really 